but we also have to look at the big picture and how we wrest power away from these very small number of multi-billionaires. Amen. Welcome you two. Yasmin Ait Abderrahman, uh, you are 23 years old and you are um, involved in a uh, political organization such as the FNV, uh, um, the biggest union of the Netherlands, and uh, you have a seat in the SER, the Social, Economic and, uh, Social and Economic Country, Council of the Netherlands. Being 23 years old, it's an interesting position, of course. How did you listen to Bernie Sanders' speech just now? Well, first of all, it was very interesting to hear you speak. Thank you. But my first question would be, you mentioned that the situation in uh, the United States is very different from Europe. And I think that the term capitalism has a very different connotation in America than it has in Europe. So I'm wondering, a lot of the problems that are in the United States, like housing, minimum wages being too low, they also happen here. But if you were a politician in Europe, what would be the first thing that you would tackle? Well, I think we have to tackle all of those issues. As it happens, I'm the chairman of the committee that deals with issues like the minimum wage. And we're going to bring forth legislation to raise the minimum wage in America to $17 an hour. But the point of the book is that we, while we tackle individual problems like housing, which is a very serious problem, I know it's serious here, it is very serious in the United States. Child care is a disaster in the United States. While we tackle the individual problems, we also have to ask the deeper questions about the structural dynamics of the system. Who has the power? So the answer right now, and what this book really is about, is the status quo may not be working for you and your friends. It is working for the people on top. In fact, I think it's fair to say that the 1% have never, ever had it so good. I suspect that's true in Europe. It is definitely true in the United States. They have more money, more power, and they like it. So I think those are issues that we've got to tackle. And I will tell you also this, based on personal experience, that these people on top, you know, they come across as nice guys, and most of them are men, not all, most of them are men, and they make donations to charities, and they have buildings and universities named after them because they're deeply concerned about education, deeply concerned about women's rights. Don't believe it. They are not nice guys. They are extremely greedy people who literally are addicted to more and more money, and they will not rest until they get more and more and more. So to answer your questions, we have got to deal, and it's my job, I'm chairman of a committee that deals with a lot of that stuff. But we also have to look at the big picture and how we wrest power away from these very small number of multi-billionaires. Amen. <laughs> Tim. Hi. Tim Hoffman, you've been making uh, programs uh, uh, for seven years, isn't it, now with Bose? With Bose, yeah, and, and, and a, a, a couple more years uh, without Bose. What would be your first? <laughs> yeah, two things. So I read in your book that you've been in the public eye for 50 years. Um, and um, when I hear you speak, you seem less tired than I am as a 35-year-old. <laughs> how do you do it? <laughs> but seriously, but how do, how do you keep that flame burning? And you have the choice to get lazy now, you know, but you don't. Um, um, how, how, how do you do this? As a U.S. senator, uh, you see with your own eyes every day the horrors that go on in my country and in the world. All right, You see it. So if you want to escape and live in a closet, and you don't have to see these things, that's one thing. You can watch TV all day. But I see it, so I, I confront it. Uh, right now, give you one example. As chairman of the, former chairman of the Budget Committee, we put billions and billions of dollars into childcare in America, which has always been a serious problem. That appropriation has expired. And right now, it is quite possible that millions of children are gonna lose their spots in child care centers. Okay, I deal with that every day. I go around the country and running for president, the honor that I had was to go to virtually every state in America. 
And I talked in meetings like this, a few hundred people, sometimes very large rallies, but sometimes groups like this. And people got up and they said, Bernie, I went to the hospital and I came out with a $100,000 debt and my family went bankrupt as a result. And people start crying in the room, all right? I see that every day. But I you choose to see that, don't you? I yeah, mean, that you, is, you, yeah. All right, that's fair enough. Yeah. But that is, among other things, my job. I see it as my job. Yeah. All right, that's what I'm paid to do, not to run away from those realities. That's one thing, that I see them every day. And you have to be kind of cold hearted not to respond to those realities. But the other thing that I want to say on a more optimistic note is that I want everybody to know this. My wife always tells me that uh, we should hand out Prozac at the end of my speeches because I get everybody <laughs> totally depressed. And I don't want that to be the case because what I do want to tell you, and why I get into it, I'll tell you why. I have had the, the fortune, the joy, of being able to speak to 20, 25,000 people of every background in the world, of every age, of every color, okay? And understand that those people want fundamental systemic change in the United States. It is there. I saw it. I witnessed it. I am part of that. So if you know that there are people all over the country, people who are on strike right now, I had the privilege of being in Detroit a couple of weeks ago, standing with them, black and white, standing up to incredible corporate greed. So to be part of that inspires me, to see people's courage inspires me, and it gives me optimism. So that's why I continue to go on. Thank you. It's inspiring. And to me, I think we, we share the same values and the same mission, maybe, from another perspective. As, uh, me, for me, it's more, uh, uh, you're a politician, I'm a journalist and activist, and, but I think we want to end at the same uh, point. So I, I walked in there and I said hi to a CEO of a bank. And uh, we we're like, oh, I haven't seen you in a while. And I think uh, you and I both make quite a lot of money, more than the average American or, or Dutch. More uh, than me. More than you. <laughs> yeah, but, but it is, isn't it? Yeah. I'm white, I'm male, I'm cis, I'm straight. A lot of privileges. How, how do, you, do you, it's a personal question, not get part of the establishment? How do you stay the outsider with the fresh ideas? as someone who's in politics for so long in the most wealthy and powerful country in the world? That's a good question, and I don't know that I... It, it, it's, uh, as my wife will tell you, I, in all the years that I have been in the Congress, and I was in the House of Representatives for 16 years, and I'm completing my third term, 18 years in the Senate, I have never spent one weekend in Washington, D.C., except once I was sick and couldn't leave. <laughs> okay, I am never there. It is not my culture. And I'll tell you something else, yeah, yeah. personal. Don't tell anybody, okay? <laughs> Turn the camera off now. The way Congress works is mostly you go in on Monday night, you have votes on Monday night. And I would find that as soon as I came back, I was feeling a little bit depressed. And it took me 10 years to figure out that it always happened on Monday night. And because the culture in Washington is such, it's a lot of phoniness, just not real life, and, and I have staff who feel the same way. They go home with the human beings, normal people, and you come to Congress, it is very different. So I grew up in a family uh, that did not have a lot of money, and that's something that has played a very important part in my life. My family struggled economically, uh, and that is something you know, I have never, ever forgotten. So it's a combination of knowing and remembering where I came from and knowing that tens of millions of people in America are in exactly the same boat as my family was. And second of all, also, I'm just not comfortable with a lot of those. Yeah, you don't like the people. Or... Yeah, in, in many ways I don't. I mean, and, yeah. you know, it's complicated. We can get into who they are. But many people don't even know that they're on the take. In other words, if you were to go to some of my colleagues in, in the Senate and say, why are you, you know, you got $100,000 in contributions from healthcare companies or the pharmaceutical yeah. industry, and, and you're doing their bidding, they would be shocked. They would honestly tell you, it has nothing to do. Yeah, I did, <laughs> really? but I, um, I just do it on my own because I think it's best. In other words, they've been, they, they buy into this, but the culture of money in Washington, D.C. is extraordinary. I'll give you one tiny example. 400, 535 members of Congress, 100 senators, 435 in the House, there are 1,800 well-paid lobbyists. You all know what a lobbyist is. Yeah. 
from the drug companies. It's the same word in Dutch. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah we do. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can you imagine? 1,800 lobbyists, former leaders of the Democratic and Republican parties, telling Congress why we should not regulate the pharmaceutical industry and why we pay the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs. That's the culture that exists there. I don't like to remind you of your age, but it's, you've been in the game for a long time now. And I am 40 years of age, you're right. <laughs> As a senator, of course, you could say you are kind of the establishment. So if you look back now, do you feel like this is for you the most effective way to make change? Or would you do it differently if you could start over now? Look, change takes place in many ways. You're in a union, right? Yes. I'm a strong believer. In fact, there will not be the kind of change we need in America without the growth of the trade union movement. So I applaud people who are organizing, who are demanding decent contracts for their union members. Journalism, my God. In America, as I think I mentioned earlier, there are eight very large uh, global media conglomerates that control 90% of what the American people see, here and read. So I have the feeling that what you talk about and write about is something that the mainstream media, the corporate media, will never touch. It is enormously important. In America, we have people who are organizing uh, around housing. Uh, they're organizing around racial justice. The, I don't know that there's any one thing that's more important. I've gone in, uh, I, I, I won't give you my whole history. It's a little bit in the book about how I got into politics, but it was very unconventional. Mm -hmm. I mean, I didn't just walk into the Democratic Party. I'm an independent, the longest serving independent. I became elected mayor of Burlington, defeating a Democrat. So my political history is different. But if there are people in this room who want to get involved in politics and be strong political leaders, that's great. If you want to get involved in journalism, and certainly the internet opens up all kinds of opportunities, that's great. Union organizing, many other areas. I don't think there's any one way. I think it's all those ways. And can we, can we go a little bit more into this idealism or pragmatism huh, about making change happen? You decided not to run a, a third time for president, but to, to endorse Joe Biden. Uh, did, do, you, do you regret that? No, I don't. Um, you know, Biden is the president. I think taking, uh, engaging him in a primary and dividing the Democratic Party at this key moment in mm -hmm. American history would be an improper thing to do. I think, look, politics is not easy stuff. No. Okay. And it's if somebody wants to get up and criticize Biden, I will join you in that criticism. Okay. But on the other hand, the moment that we are at is if Biden loses what I suggest to you is democracy in America is very much at stake. What we have got to do at this moment is to bring our people together, A, to elect Biden, but simply to do more than that, to push the president to be the most progressive president he can be. And I will tell you also that, you know, as somebody who knows the president, known him for many years, uh, his record is far more progressive than you may know. Mm -hmm. And I think his team does not do a particularly good job in talking about what they have accomplished. And we can go into it later if you would like to. Uh, but our job is to bring people together, to bring people in America who don't vote into the political process, to create a progressive agenda. What we did in the 2020 election after I dropped out is the Biden team and our team worked together on about a half a dozen issues on climate, the economy, education, healthcare, et cetera. We brought forth some of the most progressive thinkers in America. He brought more moderate people together. They sat down, they came up with ideas, and some of those ideas have actually been implemented. So our job is to bring people together, to push the president to be the most progressive president that he can be, and to defeat Trump. I think that is the task of the moment. Wouldn't you recommend to Joe Biden to make a shift to the right to make sure he maybe get some votes from Trump voters? Well, actually, I met with the president a while back. That's exactly what I did not say. Okay, what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you everything I said, but uh, I happen to believe that that would be a, not only a policy disaster, 
but a political disaster. But 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 but, but maybe for only for campaigning. So, oh. so I, I I I would hate to uh, listen. So this is not my idea of. Uh, but uh, I was just wondering. It's it's would, like you said. Be, it's it's, it's it choosing be between two two, no. two evils. So no no no. It depends. I mean, using. I'm glad art. you say so. Okay. <laughs> but this is what I think. What I believe, and I've suggested to the president, that if we can win five or ten percent, even five percent of the people who vote for Trump, working class people. Biden will win in a landslide. That means 5% less for Trump, 5% more for Biden. Can we do it? Of course we can. And what you're seeing in terms of the strike of the automobile workers and Joe Biden, and again, let me be clear, I have very strong differences with Joe Biden, but Joe Biden was the first president in the history of the United States of America to walk on a union picket line, to make it clear that he was on the side of the workers in the most important strike that we have faced in many, many years. That is not unimportant. That is not only good policy, doing the right thing, it is good politics as well. I have worked with a lot of unions in America in the last several years on many, many strikes. And what we find is that I am told by the local leadership that half or 60% of their members, often white men, vote for Trump. If we can turn around five or 10% by having Joe Biden make it clear that he is prepared to take on big money and stand with the working class, that's good politics. That will be a strong victory for Biden. So that was my advice to the president. What did he say? Well, he's walked the picket line in Detroit. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I don't want to tell you what we say in a, a private conversation, but, uh, you know, I've said this publicly as well. In this, very often, Good policy is good politics. Do you know what I mean by that? Yeah. If you do the right thing, for example, I have seen polling in America that poll just Republicans, got it, just Republicans. Do you know what the highest issue that they were concerned about? Very often older people who are quite conservative in many ways. It was not overthrowing the United States government. It was lowering the cost of prescription drugs. All right. Yeah. Now I'm going to introduce legislation, I don't know when, within a few months, we're going to do these things in a particular timeline, which will cut prescription drug costs in half. If the president endorsed that legislation, took on the drug companies, he would get millions of votes to do that. Doing the right thing means representing the needs of the working class. It means taking on big money interests. And it means when you do those things, people say, well, it's about time somebody's working for me. So I do not urge the president to become more conservative. I urge him to become more progressive. Thank you. I'm happy to hear, you know. <laughs> If you look at the political participation of young people, we talked about it beforehand. Something that worries me is that young people are the minority right now, and it's only getting worse. So. Uh, older people are the majority, which also means their vote counts much more than the vote of my generation. And also, uh, young people tend to vote less than older people. So what I uh, worry is that it will affect the political choices that are being made. Obviously, a lot of young people rallied up behind you. How do you think we can best give young people a voice in the political arena? People ask me, uh that question fairly often, and I will tell you honestly, when we began the campaigns, we never sat down, not for one minute, and said, okay, how do we appeal to young people? Never did. What we just did is talk about the issues facing America, and on virtually all of those issues, young people are more impacted than our older people, mm -hmm. all right? Young people in America earn lower wages than their parents did. Everything be equal, being equal, and this is a sad reality. I don't know how it is here in Holland, but everything being equal, the younger generation in America will have a lower standard of living than their parents. You got that? I mean, mm -hmm. moving in the wrong direction. In America, I was mentioning to you before we were up here, there are young people graduating college or graduate school, hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt, all right? And there are other young people who would like to get a higher education who can't afford to do that, Because the cost of a good college is thirty, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year, they can't afford it. So, talking about issues—healthcare, education, ending student debt, K 
canceling student debt in America. And I'll tell you another issue that brings young people into uh, politics more than any other, and that is the climate issue. I don't know what this world is going to look like 50 years from now. I don't know whether it's going to be habitable. There are young people in the United States, and I say this very sadly, young couples who say, we're not going to have any kids. We don't want to have kids because we worry very much about the planet and, and what kind of life they will have. How horrible is that? But those are issues that young people gravitate. Speak the truth to people, whatever it may be. Talk to them about the realities of their lives. Engage them in the process and then fight for the change that they need. That's how you get people involved. Do you still feel an activist or a politician or is there no opposition to it? Well, as you indicated, you know, I live a strange life because, you know, a week from Monday night, I'll be back in Washington. I'm chairman of a committee. Uh, I vote uh, all the time, and I have, that's my job. That's what I'm paid to do. Uh, on the other hand, what I understand is that if that's all that I did, I would fail. So at the end of next week, I'm going to go to, New, I'm likely going to go to New Brunswick, New Jersey, to participate to hold a hearing on a nurse's strike taking place at a major hospital there. So the answer is, I live in two worlds. I have to do my job, and I do it as best I can. I can't get the legislation that I would like. If I had my way, I would pass unit, what we call Medicare for All, a single-payer system, Canadian-style health care system. That's what I would pass tomorrow if I could. I can't. I don't have the votes. Zero Republican support. Half the Democrats don't support me. So we do the best that we can there. But real change is going to take place from the outside, from the grassroots, from the unions, from young people, from working class people, from the strikes that are taking place right now. So I live in both worlds. Can I ask you a, a Dutch example? Um, for instance, Extinction Rebellion, that's an, uh, uh, an organization here in Holland, they blocked the highway or the A12 for several days in a row, actually many days in a row. And there was a big controversy, of course, in the country, whether they should, whether they shouldn't. Um, but what struck me is that no political party, and we do have a lot, um, nobody um, actually endorsed them the f to the full and joined them, uh, though it's a mass movement, and which was quite striking to me, I thought. It's, 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 it's telling. I was wondering, would you think that really joining sort, sort of these sort of activists... I, I can't, would, you know, there are... I can't give you an answer to that because I'm not no, familiar with all the issues. Example, it is a tactic. But, yeah. I would say that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, climate change is an existential threat to the planet. Yeah. And, and it's a question of whether the planet will survive. And the goal now is to demand that your government and my government and China, the major emitter yeah. in the world, radically transform their energy system. The goal is right now, and I write this in the book, when I talk about these large corporate leaders being bad people, let me give you a few examples of what I mean. Uh, when I was a kid, the tobacco industry would be on television telling people they have doctors smoking cigarettes. They said, mm, this is a good cigarette. This guy, wore, a doctor, was saying this. And you don't, most of you don't know this. It's a very famous picture in America of the executives from the tobacco industry lined up before Congress. And they all raised their right hand. They swear to tell the truth. And the congressman asked them, uh, to the best of your knowledge, do cigarettes cause cancer and emphysema? And these guys, the CEOs of the major tobacco industries, said, oh, no, no. We have no evidence to it. And they were lying through their teeth because they had all of their scientists and their people who worked for them telling them exactly the opposite. They lied. Millions of people died and are dying today. Some of them are still pushing cigarettes on kids. You know, my father smoked two packs of cigarettes, died at the age of 58. Millions of people died needlessly young because of that. They lied. You had a Wall Street crash in 2008, which you're all familiar with, impacted the whole world. You had crooks on Wall Street who knew that they were selling mortgages that were worthless, which ended up causing the entire debacle. They lied and lied and lied. And right now, the biggest lie is the fossil fuel industry. I don't know how many of you know this, but the fossil fuel industry, these are not stupid people. They have good scientists working for them. Scientists were telling them 50 years ago that carbon emissions were going to warm the planet. 50 years ago. 
And they took that information and they hid that information. They funded organizations that denied the reality of climate. And they are destroying the planet. Got it? So these are not nice guys. They lie and they lie in order to make more and more money. So to the point about climate, this is an existential threat. We have got to take them on and fossil emissions, carbon emissions in this world, or we're not gonna have much of a planet left. So what would you advise me, for example, because I can, sometimes it's a very hard balance to keep between taking the role of an activist or taking the role maybe of more of a lobbyist, for example. What would you say in your experience is more effective? I can't tell you that. I mean, it, it depends on the moment and, and, and depends on the individual. What I do know and do believe, that change never takes place from the top on down. You've got to force that change. You, right now, the political leaders of countries all over the world are pressured by billionaires, right? By the fossil fuel companies or the drug companies, whatever it may be. That, that's where the pressure comes. And what we have got to do is build that pressure up from down below. And if you look at the history of America, which I'm more familiar with than, than Europe, if you look at the civil rights movement, or if you look at the women's movement or the gay movement, always, 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 it took place from the ground on up, and then one day a president of the United States signs a bill. Can we, can we make it personal? Because sometimes I do uh, activistic stuff, and then also left-wing politicians get really angry about not being polite enough or, or anything. And I'm always wondering, how do I influence, and I guess it's the same thing you ask yourself, how do I influence the people in power? And you are someone in power as a politician. Do you, do, you, do you remember a time when you got influenced by activists and voted different than you thought you would do? Or maybe get pissed off because of what they did? No, I mean, I think a highway. issues are raised. You know, people raise issues to my consciousness every day. It's amazing. I think one of the things you learn as a United States Senate is you cannot believe how many different issues are important to people. I mean, issues you would not have even thought of. You know, maybe you have a kid who has a particular disease, all right? And, and you know, the mom and the kid will come into the office. You get a letter for thousands of people. Please do research into this particular form of diabetes or cancer, whatever it may be. But I think, you know, you're asking a good question. And all I will tell you, in terms of influencing politics and democratic societies, if the politician knows that many thousands of people believe in a certain way and are prepared to vote in that certain way, and are prepared to vote against that politician unless he or she does the right thing, that has an impact. That really does. So organizing at the grassroots level around issues, having a very clear agenda of what you stand for, and demanding that your political leaders, if they don't want to do it, don't expect you to be voting for them. Because you're saying, um, can I make this personal, you know, how far should I go as an activist? Yeah, hmm? maybe that's the question. How far and can we go, in your opinion? I brought a, a video of something I did because when I talked to the to the uh, programmer, um, I thought people would bring videos, so it's not you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's not. Like, that you think everybody that, has a video uh, in their pocket. No, I, yeah, no <laughs> it's stupid. I know, but it's not like Bernie. That Check out what I, I did. I thought, you know? I thought, <laughs> but, but I still wanted to show you. We, anyway. No, no, we thought it was very personal. It's very nice that you brought it because it's a dilemma. In short, there, there were uh, 430 kids about to be thrown out of our country uh, because of weird policy. And uh, I took one of the, uh, those kids to the parliament and put him in front of the politicians Good. and told them, he's going to be thrown out to Iraq. Can you explain to him? Nine years old. Kid. Nine years old. They were all pissed off. Journalists were, little, were pissed off. They were, the NGOs they were, polite, were pissed but off. Pissed off. Yeah. 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 Uh, and my question to you was, which sounds very vain, but... <laughs> I think that was a brilliant tactic. Okay, thank you. <laughs> in other words... In other words, you didn't throw anything at anybody. I didn't hear anybody screaming. No. You had a child, right? Yeah, basically, yeah. A kid. Yeah. Who was asking a question to yeah. people who made a decision over his life. I think that is a brilliant way to use media, really. Thank you. <laughs> okay, now you have to... <laughs> 
Now you can be, you know, <laughs> yeah. very happy. You have I'll never... leave now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we could have gone into many more issues. Uh, um, but there's hope, again. <laughs> Read the book. It is okay om kwaad te zijn op het kapitalisme uh, door Bernie Sanders. And I would like to thank, of course, Jasmine and Tim. And, of course, Senator Bernie Sanders. Uh, very much uh, uh, all three of you for uh, your joining us. Thank you very much.